Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Neville Burke, um, one of our uh, cardiac anesthesiologists at the QE2 um, Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's associate professor of medicine in, in uh, Dalhousie University. He got his medical degree at the University of Guyana and specialized in anesthesia at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. He holds a fellowship in adult uh, uh, cardiac anesthesia and critical care, um, critical care in the University of Toronto at the Cardiac Anesthesia Fellowship at the University of Western Ontario in London. He is certified and diplomate in advanced preoperative echocardiography from the National Board of Echocardiography. His clinical and research interests are a perioperative infection and intraoperative cardiovascular anesthesia and critical care. We'll uh, show a pre-recorded uh, lecture from uh, Neville. Thank you. Greetings and welcome to my talk on acute aortic syndromes. My name is Neville Burke and I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist at the Halifax Infirmary in Nova Scotia, Canada. I have no conflicts to disclose. The objectives of our talk today will include briefly describing the risk factors and etiology of patients with acute aortic syndromes, as well as reviewing the conservative and surgical management options available for patients with aortic dissection. Then we'll get to the meat of the matter, outlining the echocardiographic evaluation of patients with this disease, particularly aortic dissection, and discussing in brief how these findings can impact surgical management. So let's get right into it. Acute aortic syndromes refer to life-threatening conditions with a common pathophysiologic pathway, which is disruption of the intima and media of the aortic wall. They include aortic dissections, intramural hematomas, penetrating aortic ulcers, aortic pseudoaneurysms, and even traumatic aortic injury. Acute aortic dissections occur account for about 80 to 90 percent of all acute aortic syndromes. Globally, the incidence ranges between 2.6 to 7.2 cases per 100,000 person years, and in Canada, they are found to be about 4.6 per 100,000. Risk factors include age more than 60 years, males more than females, hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and connective tissue disease. The temporal classification of aortic dissection has been most recently described by Boer et al. using data derived from the International Registry of Aortic Dissection. Uh, this is based on Kaplan-Meier curves that denote distinct changes in survival across the time domains, dividing the temporal aortic dissection into 0 to 24 hours as hyperacute, 2 to 7 days as acute, 0, 8 to about 21 days as acute and further than that as being chronic. As my colleague Dr. Nier had previously mentioned in a just recent presentation, the type entry malperfusion classification system, which has recently been published by the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery and the uh, Society for Thoracic Surgeons, has updated the classification of aortic dissection to now having a type A um, involving only the, AR, the ascending aorta, type B, the descending aorta, and a non-A, non-B, where the dissection flap extends through or into the aortic arch but does not involve the ascending aorta. The dissection is further described in terms of the entry location and the presence or absence of malperfusion. Management of type A dissections are usually in a surgical emergency and so are managed via surgical intervention and in that context the in-hospital mortality is about 22% though it notably doubles to about 44% in the presence of malperfusion and is significantly higher in patients who are managed medically. 
Our echocardiographic evaluation of acute aortic dissections will include assessment of the dissection flap, the true versus false lumen, and complications associated with acute aortic dissection. They will also be looking at artifacts, that important ones that we need to differentiate from a true aortic dissection, and very briefly at the role of 3D echocardiography in this disease. An aortic dissection flap will appear as an undulating linear echo density within the aortic lumen, and discontinuities within the flap are known as intimal tears. The primary intimal tear is usually more than 5 mm in width, um, though it sometimes can be as wide as about 7 to 10 mm. They are frequently located in the proximal ascending aorta. About 10% of cases, int main intimal tear may not be seen because it's located in a blind TE area, such as the abdominal aorta or distal ascending aorta. In these cases, contrast may suggest where the entry tear is located. Using color Doppler, some multiple small communications, usually less than 3 mm, are often seen in the descending aorta and they may correspond to the origin of intercostal or visceral arteries. These are known as secondary communications and they have no prognostic base. An example of a description of an aortic dissection flap is seen here, where the aortic dissection flap was extending into the ascending aorta, but the entry tear was noted to occur just in the distal arch in the region of zone 2 and was also found to be extending up into the left subclavian artery. In that context, this dissection flap can be described as type A with extension in the ascending aorta, entry point 2, so E2, and M2 with, because it involved the supraaortic vessels but M2 minus as the patient had no clinical symptoms. Symptomology. The, after identification of a dissection flap, it's important or crucial to differentiate the true from false lumen, which may be useful, provide useful guidance to the surgical team for the procedure. For example, a surgical plan may change considerably depending on where, whether the supraaortic vessels originate from a true or false lumen. And here are some criteria that we can use to help differentiate the two. First, to consider the size. So the true lumen may be considered as the lumen wholly consistent with effluence from the aortic valve uh, during systole. And often the true lumen will appear smaller in size than the false lumen and may even be seen to be surrounded by the false lumen. Next, we can consider pulsation where the flow of blood from the cardiac cycle produces systolic expansion of the true lumen, whereas it can also produce systolic compression of the false lumen. This can be seen clearly on 2D images, but is made even more clear with M-mode imaging using ECG to, and the QRS complex to do, locate the expansion of the true lumen during systole and the compression of the false lumen at the same time during systole. Flow direction is another differentiator where the true lumen will show systolic or antigrade flow during systole. However, the false lumen sometimes may show antigrade flow that is reduced or even absent during systole and occasionally may show retrograde flow. This flow direction can be further detailed using pulse wave Doppler, where the sample window is placed within the lateral edge of, the, of each lumen during a long axis view of the aorta, often denoted on the, like maybe a mid esophageal view of the descending thoracic aorta at about somewhere between 80 and 100 degrees, mostly close to 90 degrees. In this image, duplication of the velocity spectrum above and below the baseline produces an artifact that can be a little confusing and it is known as directional ambiguity. 
This occurs when the Doppler angle is close to 90 degrees. If we focus on just one side of the baseline, it will, does, however, reveal well delineated anti-grade flow in systole consistent with the QRS complex and reduced by when the sample window is placed in the true lumen and then reduced by phasic flow and the sample window is placed in the false lumen. When color Doppler is applied at the site of an intimal tear, communication flow will usually reveal flow from the true to false lumen during systole. So, an echogenic mass separated from the intimal flap and aortic wall inside of the false lumen may be indicative of thrombosis. This thrombosis may be mostly homogeneous, homogeneous if there's complete thrombosis or it can be heterogeneous as is seen here in partial thrombosis. There's some debate about this in the literature, but currently the suggestion is that mortality is worse with a residual patent false lumen and relative to complete thrombosis and it's even worse in patients with partial thrombosis of the false lumen. Now we'll consider for a short moment a few cases. In the first case we'll consider a 68 year old male with the sheer hypertension smoking who presented with acute on chest chest pain and some left leg weakness, hypotensive in the emergency room with differential blood pressures, and imaging that revealed a type A E1 M3 plus aortic dissection. The patient was brought to the operating room and gross 2D imaging via echocardiography of the aortic valve and root in long axis revealed loss of the normal contours of the proximal ascending aorta with some dilation uh, as well as a small coaptation defect. On short axis, they could also be seen some prolapse of the non-coronary cusp. Um, prolapsing of the cusp and a coaptation defect causes us to think a bit of aortic regurgitation. In that context, the mechanisms of aortic regurgitation in type A in the section will include dilation of the sinotubular junction, um, flap extension into the root of the aorta or prolapse of the flap through the left ventricle outflow tract or they could be completely unrelated to aortic dissection such as in a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. These mechanisms can then be described using the Elcori functional classification system that we may all be familiar with. And the severity of regurgitation can be also described using the classic criteria. So in our case, as is in any case, identifying the mechanism responsible for aortic regurgitation is essential in determining the repairability of the valve. In this case, color Doppler revealed features of mild regurgitation with a well-defined, small, transient flow convergence, a vena contract of just about two millimeters, and a small jet area with a pressure half time of about 968 milliseconds, so quite high. Measurements indicated that the, some dilation of the aortic root, sinotubular junction and sending aorta. And so this patient was essentially described as having mild to moderate aortic regurgitation with a mechanism that is mixed but primarily Elcuri type 1A with a dilated sinotubular junction and the sending aorta. And in that context, there was a bit of consequent l Curry type 2, which features a non coronary cusp prolapse. So, given that the functional compromise of the valve appeared to be related to anatomical distortion of the STJ here and not really um, a lesion specific to the valve, the case was approached with a plan for a valve sparing aortic root replacement. Subsequent echo revealed a normal functioning aortic valve with good coaptation height and no features of aortic regurgitation and color flow Doppler.
Second, there, second case would be a 71 year old male to history of smoking, severe COPD, a known type A chronic aortic dissection, who had a root aneurysm and moderate aortic incompetence. His elective repair of his disease was deferred because of severe uncontrolled COPD with an FEV1 of about 27% that was thought to be preclusive to his repair. Unfortunately, this patient encountered a motorvehicular collision and developed hypotension and presentation to the emergency room and an imaging was thought to have ruptured the aortic root and CT scan. Here we can see in 2D imaging of the aortic valve in the operating room in long axis again loss of normal contour of the aorta with complete effacement of the sinotribular junction and on short axis there's a bit of prolapse of the non-coronary cusp. Um, there's also significant amount of fluid in the pericardial space. Further imaging in the pericardial space revealed fairly large collections with one as wide as about 40 milli 38 millimeters and notable compression of the right and left atria. On that note, we should consider pericardial effusions and type A aortic dissections. They occur in about 40% of cases, 12% of them will result in tamponade and mechanism being usually due to rupture of the false lumen into the pericardium. In particular care must be taken around the time of drainage to control the blood pressure as the resulting hypertension from relief of the tamponade can lead to rupture of the aorta. They always pretend a poor prognosis. Using the grading system for blunt traumatic aortic injury with complete rupture, this patient would be considered to have a grade 4 injury. On color Doppler, there was features in this case of severe regurgitation with a well-defined, large, almost holodiastolic flow convergence and an eccentric posteriorly directed jet, the vena contract of about 6.5 and a uh, large jet area, low pressure half time. And on short axis imaging, there was actually what appeared to be a blush of fluid extending it between the commissions of the non coronary cusp and right coronary cusp, and thought to be due to extension of the dissection flap in that area. Measurements uh, indicated dilation of the aortic root and the sinotubular junction and ascending aorta. And so this patient was considered to have severe aortic regurgitation with a mixed mechanism, again being primarily Alcuri type 1A with dilation of the, the aortic root STJ, but also type 1D with functional loss, essentially like a fenestration, or functional loss of tissue along the closing edge of the valve cusps. Um, in context of having a lesion within the cusps and such a complex dissection flap, his operation was approached with a view to replacing the aortic valve and root. A biobental procedure was performed and post-procedural echo revealed a good repair with no concerns for aortic valve function. Another side note for learners is that the, our guidance in, with TE may be required for coronary sinus catheterization as can be seen here in severe aortic regurgitation and also procedural guidance may be required with placement of the venous cannula for cardiopulmonary bypass with the tip located in the superior caboatrial junction. Any dissection flap that extends proximal to the STG should raise concerns for coronary artery involvement. This complication occurs in about 10 to 15% of cases and the right coronary artery is most commonly involved where intimal flap may prolapse down the coronary osteum. In this case, we consider a 68 year old male with a history of hypertension pulmonary artery disease who presented after feeling unwell for a few days and an imaging was found to have pericardial fluid and a Aortic, ascending aortic dissection described as type A E2M1+. This patient's imaging revealed a dissecting flap that extended into the ostium of the left main. 
Assessment of his ventricular function initially did not show any significant changes. However, subsequent imaging revealed notable decline in function suggestive of ongoing ischemia. And the patient eventually underwent a bypass grafting surgery as part of his repair. Other major arterial involvement must be considered in aortic dissections. In this image, the patient can be seen to have a dissection flap extending into the left subclavian aorta. Patients like this with supraaortic vessel involvement may require reconstruction of the, the aortic arch. This is an image of a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer a very large atherosclerotic lesion that penetrated the internal elastic lamina and could potentially lead to a hematoma formation. Intramural hematomas refer to bleeding into the media without obvious initial rupture of the intima. There's no dissection flap seen. An aortic pseudoaneurysm involves a defect in the intima and medium contained within the adventitia of the aortic wall. 3D echocardiography can be quite helpful to provide detailed imaging of the aortic root with unfast views and even multiplanar reconstruction that can help when there are concerns for lesions such as this one quite close to the right coronary artery. There are some linear echodensities that we should be aware of, particularly in the ascending aorta in the context of aortic dissections. These must be recognized and not mistaken for aortic dissection as that can lead to errors in management. Some things to consider then would be that these lesions move parallel to the aortic wall, they extend beyond the normal anatomic boundaries, and there are similar blood flow velocities on both sides. Also, M-mode will reveal reverberation by showing the artifact being twice the distance from its originating structure, such as the posterior wall of the right pulmonary artery in this image. In closing, we should recall that T has multiple roles in surgical decision making for acute aortic syndrome, including confirming the diagnosis guiding the procedure in terms of true versus false lumen, extent of the dissection flap, coronary malperfusion or assessment of other complications, and it's also assessment of adequacy of surgical therapy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Neville, for your excellent presentation again. Uh, I'm uh, very uh, glad to uh, see our session put in together. Um, there are a few questions. Uh, it seems that uh, there is no questions in the Q&A, but some questions are in the chat. Um, um, and all the panelists are now uh, on uh, camera and I think on the um, audio too. So um, I would start with one uh, question that was placed uh, for Braden. Uh, can you please comment on durability of most common uh, type uh, aortic valve sparing techniques? Sure, so that's uh, an excellent question with uh, perhaps a complicated answer. Um, certainly, uh, there's a, an evolving process and, and part of that is because of uh, you have centers of excellence where these techniques are developed and they've had some long studies showing excellent long-term durability but as we try to move these techniques into centers that do less and have less experience uh, the question is can you repeat that durability um, and can you find uh, scientific ways of measuring valves and standardizing the repair so that junior surgeons can have the same long-term outcomes. So kind of a synopsis back around 2013, there was a study looking at 20-year um, 
freedom from re-intervention or a significant aortic regurgitation. And for the re-implantation technique had about 89% uh, freedom at 20 years and remodeling technique 63%. Since that time, they've developed external rings to help with remodeling techniques and stabilizing the aortic valve annulus. And so um, in 2017, uh, Dr. Lansack published uh, freedom of uh, 78% at um, seven years for having less than uh, plus two aortic regurgitation. And Dr. Schaefer published 83% uh, uh, freedom from significant aortic regurgitation or reoperation at 15 years for bicuspid aortic valves and 91% freedom at 15 years uh, for tricuspid valves. But uh, certainly these are centers of excellence. And as these techniques expand, I think that's uh, something that's going to change over time. And a systematic review in 2023 for reimplantation techniques showed a 91% uh, freedom from reoperation at 10 years. And when you consider the alternative being aortic valve replacement, we know bioprosthetic valves degenerate, mechanical valves uh, can become thrombosed or infected. Um, there's also risks with those procedures as well. So there's certainly an uh, indication for uh, valve sparing procedures, but even the guidelines would suggest it depends on the experience of the center and the surgeon. I think, uh, yeah, this is excellent summary, uh, Brendan. Indeed, uh, quite often what is published by people who did a lot of these procedures, Dr. Schaefer, Dr. Lake Curry, Dr. David, uh, everybody is asking, can we repeat this excellent results? On the other hand, uh, they should be complemented for doing long-term follow-up of their patients. And this is probably the way to go and the way for all of us to learn more uh, uh, about durability. As, a, as you mentioned, generally speaking, repair is always better than replacement, but this must be done properly following proper indications. Thank you very much for your comment. I have a question for the panelists, particularly for Neville. So, and it's regarding timing for uh, surgery in type A arctic dissections. Uh, I think Peter uh, addressed the thing for the type B. However, for type A, uh, when do you think the operation uh, is indicated? Uh, can we wait or shouldn't be waiting? Hey, Victor. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think that generally the, the the recommended management for all type A dissections and essentially all type A acute aortic syndromes is surgical management. Because um, as we can we would have seen um, from the outcome findings, the mortality is significantly worse in patients who are managed medically. Um, so unless there is some kind of clinical situation that would preclude surgical management of the patient then one should be moving towards access to the operating theater and management surgically as soon as possible. Um, the One of the things that we should always aim to avoid is surgical therapy before the onset of any form of a malperfusion syndrome, because malperfusion itself essentially has been shown to be associated with at least twice higher mortality rates of patients, essentially doubling it from about 22 to 44 percent or so. So I would say that as essentially once a patient has been diagnosed with an acute aortic syndrome, particularly acute aortic dissection, that the plan should be for them to go to the operating room as soon as possible and not to wait for a feature of malperfusion to prompt the operation. Uh, thank you for for your answer. Can you expand a little more on malperfusion? Because uh, what if the patient has some uh, symptomatic uh, situation in the kidneys or in the uh, abdominal vessels? What would be the approach? Which which one goes first, or uh, what 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 do you know, and uh, how can you recommend the approach for that case? 
Okay, so essentially, uh, malperfusion can be thought of or described as in two ways. Um, there is the vascular finding or imaging finding of malperfusion, which would be the a finding of an extension or just the extension of one of the dissection flaps into the vasculature perfusing a particular organ. So, for example, with the patient with the dissection flap of the brachiocephalic artery or the section flap extending into a renal or, or any other um, major arterial branch can be considered to be an imaging feature of malperfusion. Outside of the imaging features, the patient can also have clinical features of malperfusion, which can be either um, symptomatic or biochemical. So a symptomatic feature of malperfusion may be weakness in the leg because of the section of uh, uh, the section flap that's extended down into maybe the iliofemoral branch or weakness in the upper arm. Um, whereas the biochemical features of malperfusion may be uh, increasing creatinine because of compromise of the renal vasculature. Um, depending on the, the, the feature of malperfusion, usually if the patient is only found to have a vascular feature with no um, associated clinical symptomology, um, I see somebody mentioning um, what to be approach neurologic. So if there's stroke in particular, so most likely involving the, um, the supra aortic vasculature, the patient should be taken to interventional radiology or the current recommendations are that they should actually go to the an, an, for an interventional procedure to to reanastomose the supraortic vessels prior to coming to the operating room. Thank you for your response. Not sure if that's helpful there. There are other questions here. So in type A aortic dissection with acute aortic regurgitation, are there any echocardiographic parameters which can distinguish between aortic valves requiring replacement or those that uh, may improve after ascending aorta repair? Um, yes, I think essentially what we look for in the aortic valve um, post the well, to determine if there is a need for replacement of the valve just versus just re re repair of the aorta, is that there should be some anatomical lesion or that suggests that there is injury to the valve or the apparatus supporting the valve itself, such as the an injury that usually would extend proximal to the sinotribular junction. Um, within the sinus of valsalva into the valve leaflets or the actual um, cusps of the valve or the annulus of the valve itself. If we're barring those or if none of those are present and there is just dilation of the aortic root, um, which suggests that there is no direct injury or compromise of the function of the valve itself, then more often than not, an approach can be taken to spare the valve. If there seems to be a lesion within the valve itself, then it would more likely than not be that not sparing the valve or doing a, a valve sparing root replacement may still result with significant valve dysfunction postoperatively. And in that case, it may be better to repair the valve. Thank you, Neville, for your response. Now, this question is for Peter. Uh, could you please clarify again indications for open and endovascular repair versus medical therapy for type B dissections? Um, yeah, sure. Hi, Dr. Minkovic. Thank you for your question. Um, so um, basically, uh, you know, so the, the recent European and uh, SDA's guidelines, uh, they were basically asking two questions. So if there are any evidence of... Um, complicated features <clears throat> um, or uh, high-risk features, then the patient should get an endovascular, so a T-VAR uh, repair. Um, really, T-VAR and endovascular uh, repair for type B dissection is supplanted open repair. So it's only um, type B e dissection without any high-risk features, which can either be, they can be divided into morphological features, so what you find on, um, on imaging and clinical features, those are the only um, type B dissections uh, that are amenable to optimal medical therapy. 
So the more the, the clinical criteria is, is really looking at persistent um, pain or un, and, and, and hypertension or uncontrollable or poorly controlled hypertension. So that would make it a, um, the, those are the clinical high risk features. And the morphological features, there's quite a few of them, but it talks to uh, where the actual entry point is, how big the entry point is and how large the false lumen is, for example. And then the complicated features are the presence obviously of rupture, any malperfusion syndrome, um, and then completely uncontrollable pain and hypertension. Um, and then the, uh, yeah, so that those are the, those are the, that would be the, the, the answer to that, to that point. Yeah, there is another question about malperfusion. Uh, I, I have for, forgotten to mention the, the, the person who uh, put the question. This is from Stefan Ledot. Uh, what would be your approach with the implication of a neurologic malperfusion stroke in particular? I think it's for Neville. Yes, thanks, Victor. I think I touched on that a little bit before. Um, in that, the, there are some newer recommendations now, um, suggestive, particularly in the context of the um, new guidelines recently published by the European Society and STS, that would suggest that the patient with supraortic malperfusion may benefit from a, a red radiological intervention or going to the radiology lab for interventional procedure prior to going to the operating room. Um, again, this would be limited by the capacity or resource capacity of the institution at which the patient is being managed, because if they are in a place where there is not the capacity for immediate neuroradiological intervention, the safest approach would still be to go to the operating room emergently as for any other patient presenting with the type A um, aortic dissection that involves neurologic compromise. If the facilities are available, then they should proceed to neuroradiological neuro intervention first. Yeah, I agree with Neville. In our institution, uh, any uh, uh, stroke will go to the stroke code and to interventional radiology, most likely first. Uh, this would be a, a, a perfect case for the hybrid room where the interventional radiologist can do the stent uh, uh, for, the, for the brain first, and then uh, the cardiac surgeons will go for the um, uh, rest of the procedure. Uh, we have a limitation in our institution is that uh, we don't have uh, uh, the technicians for the hybrid room 24-7, uh, but there are uh, nurses and technicians for the interventional IR suite. So uh, this would be a challenge uh, to, to figure out uh, where to go, whether the third floor or the fifth floor. But uh, I think uh, the, the trend, at least in Germany, is that the cases with type A aortic dissections go for a hybrid room and a catheters are placed to, to see angiograms uh, uh, before uh, going for surgery. Um, I don't think, uh, I I have think a there question. are a couple more questions. Uh, you go ahead, please. Yeah, I think uh, I'm sure we all will reach to, to guidelines which all of you mentioned by Czerny from Europe and STS. But just for technical clarification, if there is imaging showing that malperfusion to brain is caused by 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 basically uh, head vessels going from the false lumen. What interventional radiology or interventional neuroradiologists can do about this without repairing dissection? Well, it, it, it will depend on the specific case, obviously. Uh, the problem is it would be the time. So uh, uh, if they can stent or open, some, sometimes they can do penetration to improve the flow. A penetration in the in the false lumen, improving the flow to the to the true lumen, uh, so we can uh, gain time for the brain uh, to have some kind of perfusion, and then go for the for the uh, surgical correction and the elephant trunk or whatever is required. But again, uh, this will depend on the very specific case. Very challenging uh, situations. Uh, because in these in these cases, time is brain function, and uh, 
fixing the the perfect surgery for with the elephant trunk may not fix the ischemic uh, brain. Thank you. So is there any more questions from the panelists? Just unmute yourselves, and uh, I don't have anything more in the in the chat or in the QA. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Victor, for curating excellent session. Thank you very much to all panelists for fantastic lectures. I, I think it's a it's a great summary of the day. Uh, uh, the end of this session brings us to to the end of day number one of our symposium. Uh, very short closing remarks, um, uh, not to keep you busy and longer. Uh, once again, big thanks to all participants. It's always a big effort on Saturday uh, to devote your time to extra education. It is very much appreciated. Thank you so much to all curators and speakers. We have three very interesting, very different sessions. I think we all learn a lot and uh, we will reach to references and other sources which you mentioned to learn even more. Um, I would like to remind to everyone to fill out evaluations that are crucial for all of us to improve for next year and to also choose the topics for, for uh, next symposia. Uh, this is very important, so I strongly encourage you to do it today if possible, if not tomorrow. Uh, I will remind everyone that the certificates of attendance will, um, will come to your mailboxes soon after our symposium is finished. Uh, once again, uh, uh, by finishing the symposium or attendance in symposium and filling evaluations, you will get 12 accredited points um, from Royal College. Uh, I would like to also mention the recordings of all lectures will be available to all participants, more or less within the week of um, of uh, week after we, we after we finish our symposium. Um, you are also more than welcome to submit uh, any questions, suggestions to our chat. Um, and that's it for today. We are meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, at the same time, 8.45, we have another three fascinating sessions. Um, uh, one will be Canadian, uh, the other one from IACTA members, so European or so-called European session, and one from United States. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Arden, Mark, Fatima and the team for helping with all technical difficulties and see you tomorrow.